Hi. Hello, how are you? <laughs> Fine, and you? I'm good, I'm good. Are you having a nice day? <laughs> nice to meet you. Uh, uh, quite day, yeah. <laughs> quite working day. And you? Uh, so far, so good. Never a dull moment here. Where, where are you? I'm in Paris. I'm in the uh, 18th uh, uh, um, arrondissement of Paris, near the Butte Montmartre, in uh, my apartment. <laughs> and where are you at? I'm in Brooklyn, New York. What do you do for, uh, uh, for a living? Sure. So I, um, I'm a professor at a university called Vanderbilt University in the United yeah. States. Um, and I'm the director of a program called the Center for Medicine, Health, and Society. So we study healthcare and the world, healthcare and society and politics. And I also write, I write books uh, for a living. My last book was a book called Dying of Whiteness that looked at the ways that uh, many white Americans uh, are making their decisions about politics based on, on racism and, and not so much on public health, which I think is becoming a big risk factor in, in the world right now in terms of just the way the yeah. United States is, is dealing with this. How about yourself? Oh, I was a professor. Uh, I studied and I taught philosophy and I wrote books uh, um, about philosophy, mostly on contemporary philosophy. Uh, I'm a specialist of Michel Foucault, which is very common in the United States, but not so much in France. Because, <laughs> and, and I started to, to work on Foucault in the, in the 90, 90s. Uh, there were very few people who were working on his work. Um, in the academic field, many people were uh, uh, relieved by its death. You know, it was it was a way, and it was good. <laughs> so nowadays, um, I run the the uh, public programs at the Centre Pompidou in Paris. You know, I, I'm in charge mm -hmm. of uh, uh, concerts and dance and cinemas and talks, uh, performing arts and and mixing things together. What kinds of work are you doing in, in the meantime? Well, I try to write, I try to um, think about what's happening. And uh, I, as you know, uh, Foucault wrote a lot about uh, biopolitics and uh, in the link between biology and politics. So I try to uh, reread the text to complicate a little this uh, way of uh, seeing and this way of uh, uh, using the the concept of biopolitics in this uh, in these times. I study race. Yeah. What we're seeing in the United States is that the ways that the illness is playing out is highlighting the profound racial and economic disparities in our in our country. Yeah, but it's also showing how fractured and polarized people are that that they can't work together. I mean, the virus in so many ways is a common enemy. Um, hmm. But uh, because of the intense polarization in our country, um, polarization about race, about politics, um, that's being fomented by our government. I mean, my research usually is going to talk to people. You know, I also do a lot of data, a lot of analysis, but um, I'm trying to connect with people. One of my main research areas is on guns, firearms. Um, and so usually I go out and I talk to people who own guns. Um, and find out how they feel. There's a big issue right now with a lot of people purchasing weapons. Um, and, you know, it seems crazy because you can't really shoot a virus with a bullet. I would love to be talking to people and finding out how they feel about it. It's, you know, I'm doing my best to connect to people on, you know, phone calls and stuff like that, but it also only tells you a small part of the story. Well, th this exercise is wonderful because we should expand our networks right now. And it's hard we're learning as a species how to do that, not just as researchers. Um, but how do you do that when you're all you, the people you're talking about or talking to often are just people you already know or people who you're already connected with on social media or something like that? So ways to broaden the network, I think, are are challenging right now. An epidemic is not uh, only a sickness; it's uh, uh, an interaction between a sickness and and, and a, a medical system. You know, yeah. and, uh, um, and that's quite interesting because that's a, a Foucauldian experience. <laughs> Foucault said that uh, well, things are relations, you know. <laughs> so uh, um, that's why the, the concept of biopolitics interests me these days. Can you say a bit more about that, about it not just being a sickness, but being an, in, an, um, an interaction? Such things as an epidemic is... Uh, um, a complex, a, uh, 
yes, a relation between social, historical, cultural conditions and events and bio biological events and uh, political problems are also uh, medical problems, especially since uh, politics uh, uh, has decided to uh, deal with the life, and that's what bio biopolitics means in uh, Foucault's works. It, it, it designs the, this moment where um, where politics decided to uh, not only to give death and to execute people, to, but to to make them live, to make them live longer, and uh, uh, to uh, uh, increase the health, public health, etc. And we are in the middle of it now. And in France, uh, there is all this debate about, uh, um, well, uh, the president said that it's not the, the time to uh, um, uh, discuss politics because it's a war and it's uh, a, a medical issue. But, well, uh, since uh, three or four centuries, uh, medical issues are political problems. So <laughs> let's do that. And then let's discuss that. It's interesting because in the United States, we're seeing, I think, exactly the opposite response, which is that this medical crisis has become profoundly a political crisis. The Trump administration and our government have made it very political and very polarizing in ways that I think are counter to the health of people. In other words, if you think about the ways that this virus works, right, um, it, it, it really, as I was saying before, it, it really depends on cooperation, right? You wanna actually create the broadest sense of national unity um, that you can. Um, and instead the messages from our government are, you know, attacking the press or making different states compete with each other for resources like ventilators or, or finances, um, playing to, I think, very clear kind of racial stereotypes also exacerbating this idea that people need to get guns to protect themselves from one another. And so in a way, the, the response of our government has been to make this an entirely political and po polarizing uh, power grab in a particular way. It's almost the opposite of what you're saying in France, which is that by overtly politicizing this, by making this not just political, but really about the American polarized political system, it's exacerbating yeah. polarizing fault lines that make it harder for us to treat this crisis um, at all, really, because uh, you know the idea about this virus is you're not gonna have a treatment in one location, but not in another location. Everybody is either safe or everybody is at risk. And so the idea that any one community is safe while there's still pockets of virus around is, 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 a, is a fantasy, it's false. But uh, uh, there's one thing interesting in what you describe is that uh, it shows how much uh, social distancing is a cooperative strategy. In Paris, you can go out uh, about an hour a day. Uh, when you are in the streets and there are other people, you are so conscious that they are there. Uh, that's frightening. Uh, in usually, uh, being in the streets, to be in the streets, uh, you have to forget uh, the uh, other people's bodies. And um, I don't know how we'll be able to, to take uh, the, the uh, subway um, in the future, because uh, to take the subway, you, have to, you, you don't have to be awake. <laughs> you, you have to be uh, uh, sleepy or uh, uh, forgetting other people's bodies. And it's impossible nowadays. Like in New York, for example, we're all dependent on the safety of each other to social distance, right? The community we're forming yeah. right now is a community of people who are trying to safeguard communal safety by staying away from each other. Um, mm -hmm. At the same time, staying away from each other makes you really fear other people, in the, you know, embodied people. So when, you know, I, we try to go for a run in the morning very, very early when we can. And when you see another person, you immediately <laughs> run away from yeah, them. Yeah, you have these strange moves, you know, <laughs> these, those curves <laughs> in the landscape. It's just, a, it's, just a, it's just a funny dance. I'm depending on other people and fearing other people at the same time, you know, for your for yeah. your safety. We, we are discussing about it uh, for the Centre Pompidou. We are discussing with a choreograph to, to do something uh, uh, on this, dance on this cooperative dance of social distancing it's a it's a very interesting uh, choreographic material well so that's that's really you know what is the what is the role of what is a pandemic 
world like? And then what is a post-pandemic world like? How many of the changes that we're seeing now are going to be lasting changes? The challenge for humanity right now is about how do you reconceptualize the everything you've ever known about social interaction for the most part. I mean, it's it's yeah. it's 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 it, trauma to a, a, a trauma, an unimaginable trauma in a particular way. Um, and and you know, and what does that mean for human connection? Uh, what does that mean for human engagement? But also, what does that mean for just practical levels? How the old frameworks that we used before, um, racism. Um, uh, economic disparity, um, they're, they're actually incredibly unuseful for a post-pandemic world because everybody has to be safe, everybody has to be cooperating. If that's not the case, um, then, then, um, then we're all at, at risk, we're all in danger. And so in a way, restarting in an optimistic sense means overturning some of the core um, issues that led to inequality and injustice. Um, but what we're seeing because everybody's so terrified is the opposite happening. People are becoming more tribal, more, more fearful. So I think it's kind of a challenge for humanity about which of the old structures that feel very familiar to us but were very not useful are ones that we can get rid of to start, you know, trusting, trusting social systems a bit more. I wrote a book uh, a few years ago about uh, this particular problem. The uh, book is in, uh, the title is uh, Recommencer. Uh, you could translate it by uh, starting over or by once again. And because the fact that this uh, idea of doing something once again is very, uh, is, is such a paradox, you know, because you have to begin, but to begin again is a contradiction because you have to be conscious of what was before. So that's not a beginning, but that must be a beginning. If it's not a very beginning, you just have to continue. So how possible to uh, 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 at the same time begin and not begin, and uh, um, unfortunately, I think that uh, uh, humanity, in such case, uh, uh, uses amnesia. And uh, uh, my fear is that uh, after this horrible crisis, uh, things will start again as usual, and people will be uh, very. Uh, um, uh, in a hurry to to forget what happened and to uh, uh, get back to business. That, so because there are, is also an economical uh, uh, crisis and this contradiction between the necessity of uh, economy to start again and our necessity to change um, social things and uh, things in our uh, political systems, etc. This contradiction is terrible. I mean, I, I feel the same way. That's a beautiful way to put it, really. I mean, I, I keep thinking because in the United States, of course, we have all this pressure to restart the economy. Um, but the economy that everyone is imagining restarting is the old economy. Um, mm -hmm. It's the economy that generated capital and other um, resources by by particular modes of engaging with each other and so people just think we're just going to go back into the street some people are going to get sick some people aren't but we're just going to restart the economy and I think hopefully over time people are going to realize that the, the new economy is going to be dependent on this new reality right that, that it's not just like we're going to go back to reopening restaurants or schools or anything like that and so it really does um, it really does it just takes a lot of creativity, but also a lot of nostalgia because people have a hard time giving up, you know, not just the old economy, but the old economy links to our nostalgia for the way the world was before. You know, it's not the same uh, thing as before. Uh, in a, in a, in a, uh, dans un monde abîmé, uh, we should say in France. It's, uh, it's not a brand new world, you know, uh, something is broken and you won't fix it, uh, so it could be as before. It does make you appreciate, you know, people have lived through different traumas in their life, but you know, it just makes you think about the people, I mean, for me at least, you know, my father is a Holocaust survivor and I have a lot of family who escaped different things, but you know, I didn't, you never really understand. It's kind of like those are old time war stories that people of other generations tell, you know, what it meant to live through the depression, what it meant to live through the war. And it really just, 
changes your outlook because not just of the experience, but because of the sense that starting over takes so much bravery and courage because you're also leaving behind this idea of who you were before. And I think, I think that it's just such a bittersweet, it's, it's so bittersweet. And I think we're, I think, you know, it just, it, it just so much more empathy for almost for war stories, survivor stories, um, immigration yeah. stories that, that we've yeah. heard. Yeah, I think that we, 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 we have to uh, uh, um, identify uh, the stories that could help us. M migrants uh, have many problems in France and Europe, and we, we wrote a book with my friend Marie Cosne about this particular thing, is that, uh, which stories could help us to uh, understand differently what happens to people when they decide to quit Africa to get uh, in Europe, uh, and what which stories they bring with them, which stories in our uh, even in our uh, um, patrimony uh, could uh, help us. She translates uh, Latin uh, uh, poems or uh, Greek odysseys and says, "Well, uh, let's let's uh, let's search in our." Uh, 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 library, what could help us do to understand this, to face this issue. We only have a few more moments, so let's talk about recommendations, please. Okay, okay, so you begin. You prompted me to want to go back and read some more Foucault right now, <laughs> to be honest. Foucault is definitely not dead. Um, you know, there's a there's a tension, I think, for, for us here. The, the, the um, dissociating is so bittersweet right now. In other words, um, you know, we're here in our apartment in Brooklyn, and in the beginning we were watching a bunch of like movies and reading about stories about um, pandemics, you know, <laughs> to understand and everything from, you know, books like The Plague to, um, to movies like World War Z, and it was just scary because it was like they were so they were so correct, like they were so on the mark that it, it was. Um, and then we started just associating and watching like the whole country right now in the United States is obsessed with this show called The Tiger King, um, which is complete mindless documentary about this crazy guy who owns a tiger farm. Um, and, 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 and it's hard because when you watch things that are or read things that are about the old world, like we found ourselves getting very angry about how much people in the old world before the pandemic took for granted the fact that they could just go outside and talk to each other. So it was very <laughs> sweet because on one hand it was mindless dissociation, but on the other hand, it was like a snapshot of the world the way it used to be where people took for granted that they could just go out and talk to each other. In such moments, you everything uh, uh, gets you back to, to, to the things you're living. And for example, I was thinking about a, a concert. I, I will send you the link, a French singer uh, named Christophe. And he died today uh, of a um, uh, 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 respiratory disease, but everything, everybody knows that it's a uh, coronavirus. A wonderful singer, an old man, uh, he began to, uh, to write, uh, uh, began by writing a, a very, cheesy songs, you know, very uh, songs for, to, to dance on the beach. Uh, and uh, uh, from time to time, he began a, 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 a really a, a character in French culture, uh, a dandy, someone very secret, uh, very uh, retired. And he was a, a, a beautiful composer, uh, some kind of a, a, a French Scott Walker, maybe. Uh, some, some, someone like that. So I have this concert uh, that he gave in Italy in the Villa Medicis, and it's linked to to, to your subject. You know, uh, uh, I think that we can't uh, understand anything uh, in this moment if we don't uh, um, uh, take a distance from it. Uh, right. But that's, that's complicated, of course. Wonderful. Listen, I would love to keep speaking. This is very, very lovely to speak with you. I would love to, love to keep yeah, talking. Yeah, that was a real pleasure. Real pleasure. Yeah. So, yeah. Uh, have a nice day. Uh, stay safe. Same. And, uh, uh, well, be patient and calm. Yeah. <laughs> I look forward to meeting in person. I'll buy you a coffee in Brooklyn, or, um, and then we can have a, a glass of wine in Paris together. Oh, 
yeah, yeah, I can't wait, but we'll have to wait. <laughs> bye bye. Take care. Bye bye.